Hey, my name is Tobias and I'm a high school student with the goal of innovating technology to combat climate change. Today I'll be walking you through how lithium ion batteries work and an experiment I did with temperature. So on my journey to becoming an alternative energy expert, the one recurring theme I come across all the time is that there's no perfect solutions yet. And what I mean by that is just everything has a trade-off. Nuclear energy is great, but people are super scared of it. And solar is great, you can capture energy from the sun, but how are you going to store it? Most solutions face this kind of dilemma, and every expert I speak with leads me to ask myself more questions. Like a couple of weeks ago, I was on the phone with Carl Rusadil, who is the founder and CEO of Element Technologies, which is a hydrogen company. And he just blew my mind with this great quote of his. He said, why are we shifting towards weather-dependent technologies to correct the weather? It's this weather-dependent nature of the most popular renewables like solar and wind that makes energy storage innovation so crucial in the upcoming years. If we're gonna transition to a weather-dependent grid, we need better energy storage to keep the lights on at night, basically. And thinking about this weather storage dilemma made me also curious about what are the effects of weather on storage itself, too. So I decided to run a simulation uh, in MATLAB on lithium ion batteries to see how their performance would change with temperature. So let me just walk you through it out. First, let me just give a quick explanation of how lithium ion batteries work, and more specifically, a lithium cobalt oxide battery. But most LIBs, which are lithium ion batteries, they work the same way. At a high level, you can think of them as having three parts, a cathode, an anode, and an electrolyte in between. That's a special thing. The cathode is the positive terminal, and it's made of cobalt oxide. And the anode is the negative terminal, and it's made of graphite, which is pure carbon, but in a crystalline geometry. So you might be wondering, where's the lithium? Well, depending on how discharged or charged your battery is, the lithium atoms will be in different places. Let's say you're working from home and your battery is at 100%. In this case, all the lithium atoms would be stacked in between the graphite layers at the anode. Now let's say the opposite, you work all day at a cafe and your battery drains to 0%. Well then in this case, all the lithium atoms would be at the cathode stacked, intercalated in between the cobalt oxide. So electricity is produced by the reaction that brings the lithium atoms from the anode to the cathode. Let's go back to the cafe scenario one more time. You show up at the cafe with your battery fully charged. So all the lithium atoms are at the anode and you open your computer and you start working. One thing I didn't mention about lithium atoms is that they really want to get rid of their one valence electron. So when you open your computer, you provide a path for that one valence electron to leave its atom and go through the wire. And so once they go through the wire, they come back, they go to the cathode, which is where the cobalt oxide is, and they join the cobalt, which is positively charged because oxygen took its valence electrons. So to balance the new negative charges at the cathode, the lithium atoms move to the cathode from the anode, but instead of moving through the wire because they're too big, they move through the electrolyte. So the definition of an electrolyte is a liquid or gel that contains ions that can be decomposed by electrolysis. <coughs> so that's a wordy definition that doesn't really help us. What you should know is that the electrolyte is made of lithium salts dissolved in, uh, dissolved in a bunch of solvents. And this actually increases the efficiency of the battery. Because think about it, the lithium atoms that move from the anode to the cathode, instead of them having to move, the, the one that gets bumped off and moves to the cathode, instead of that one having to make its way all the way through the battery to the cathode, instead, the uh, lithium atoms that are already dissolved in the solvent can take its place at the cathode. And just one more thing you should know is that the electrolyte doesn't let electrons pass through. That's why the electrons go through the wire instead of through the electrolyte. So that's about all you need to know to understand the results of my experiment, but I'll still give a quick recap because I know that might have been confusing. First, when your battery is fully charged, all the lithium atoms are at the anode, intercalated, and they have their valence electrons. And when you start discharging your battery, those valence electrons separate from their lithium atom and go through the wire to reach the cathode. And what this does, because electrons are negatively charged, there's an accumulation of negative charge at the cathode. So the lithium atoms move through the electrolyte to the cathode to balance that negative charge. And the reverse process happens when you charge your battery. When you charge your battery with a charger, 
the charger applies an external voltage, uh, just acting like a pump to move current or electrons from the cathode back to the anode, and the lithium atoms do the same thing. They move through the electrolyte to make their way to the anode, and once all the, anode, uh, once all the lithium atoms are at the anode and they're paired up with their electrons again, then your battery is fully charged. So now that you're a knowledge-filled battery fanatic, we can take a look at my simulation. But you might be wondering, why simulations? Well, battery simulations can help speed up production and optimization of batteries by simply testing conditions in simulation instead of real life. For example, if you wanted to test the aging effects on your battery over two and a half years, instead of taking two and a half years and all the money and time that that takes, you could test in real life for eight months and then based on the parameters you get from that testing, simulate what the effects would be for the remaining two and a half years. So basically, in short, battery simulations can help speed up production and uh, avoid the costly testing that happens in real life. Okay, so let's jump to MATLAB. So here's a look at my simulation and the goal of this simulation is to see the impacts of temperature on SOC, which is state of charge. So like the percent charge of your battery and voltage. So here's a subsystem and these are scopes. And when you input things to a scope like this, it'll put all your values on a time graph. So if we go into the subsystem right here, uh, we can see all these batteries. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What I did is that I used a created equivalent circuit. So an already pre-made equivalent circuit of a lithium ion battery. You can see right here, a lithium cobalt oxide. So an equivalent circuit is what battery researchers and companies will use to model their battery on a computer in a simulation based on the parameters they got from data they tested in the real lab. So if we look a bit deeper into what this battery actually is, we can go and look under mask right here. You see that there's a bunch of stuff. Um, all of these parameters are being influenced by a big cacophony of, of stuff that you learn from the lab. But we're not gonna look at that. We're just gonna look at how I have all these seven batteries, these equivalent circuits, and I'm discharging them all at the same rate at minus two amps. And the only thing that's changing here is the temperature input. So here I'm inputting a constant of minus 40 to the temperature, whereas here minus 20, and it goes all the way down, minus 10, 10, 10 I mean, all the way up, sorry, 0, 10, 20, 40. So then what happens from here is the outputs like SOC and voltage will come out from these batteries and into this subsystem, which is just a complete mess, uh, but that's why it's a subsystem. These values are broken apart so that only the SOC values will go to one output right here and only the voltage values will go to one output right here. And then this output um, goes to this output, which then goes to the SOC. So if we run the battery simulation for 9,720 seconds right here, which is about the amount of time it'll take to discharge these batteries, then we can see what the effects on temperature are on the, on the batteries since I'm discharging them at the exact same rate and they're the exact same equivalent circuit, all the parameters are the same. So we can run our simulation right now. So here's our first graph, SOC. And above we have them named battery subsystem one uh, colon one battery system one colon two so I could rename them which I did in the article but just for the purpose of time right here the yellow is the minus 40 degrees and all of these going up uh, are higher degrees so here the pink I believe is at 40 degrees Celsius so we can also check the voltage scope now to see our voltage values and you can see that the same thing happens battery subsystem two colon one is the one on the complete bottom and the pink one at the top is also the highest temperature. So I'll start with the SOC graph and we can actually explain these results that you see on the graph through the chemistry that we learned earlier. So if you look at it, at lower temperatures, the battery capacity seems to drain quicker. And the reason why is because at lower temperatures, there's the electrolyte becomes less conductive that's also called internal resistance, but the electrolyte becomes less conductive, so it lets less lithium, ad uh, lithium ions move through it. And so what that means is that there's less lithium atoms and electrons available to move through, uh, so therefore less electricity can be produced for the same amount of discharge. 
If we look at the voltage, different graph, but same thing, lower temperatures, lower voltage. And the reason for this is, again, internal resistance. If you think of voltage as the pressure which, with which electrons are being pushed, well, just like a pipe, if you have more resistance inside that pipe, the pressure is going to be lower. So does that mean that lithium ion batteries are always better in hot weather versus cold? Well, no, not really. Based on the two variables we looked at, it may seem that way, but there are other things to take into account, like aging effects and safety is one other one. When lithium ion batteries reach an internal temperature of 60 degrees and above, they run the risk of catching on fire or blowing up. And that's a temperature that's a lot easier to reach at 40 degrees Celsius than at zero degrees Celsius. So the truth about these batteries is just, they don't perform very well at extremes, but that's like anything. I'm no anti lithium ion battery person. The truth is we should be really grateful for the strides these batteries are making, because like I said, if we're gonna transition to a fully renewable grid, we're gonna need better energy storage to go through the night. And battery simulations are gonna be a really, really valuable ally in this journey. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you're interested in going more in depth, I wrote an article on the same topic that you can read down below. And I also send out a monthly newsletter with updates on projects like these. So if you're interested, please, please join. And besides that, I'll see you in the next video.